Hello everyone, thank you for joining today's DOD Environmental Planning and Conservation Webinar Series presentation. As a reminder, today's presentation will be recorded and then emailed to the HPWG distribution list. Today's presenters are Allison Shepard, the Project Manager at the Veterans Curation Program, or the VCP, and Kimberly Blake, Blank, sorry, the, the Assistant Project manager at the VCP. They will be discussing the Veterans Curation Program, Heroes Preserving History. Following the presentation, we will have time for questions. Before we get started, please take a moment to make sure make sure your phones and computers are on mute. And with that, I will turn it over to Allison and Kimberly. Thank you. Allison, Kimberly. Hi, good afternoon. Um, Hopefully everyone can hear me okay. Um, as previously mentioned, my name is Allison Shepard and I'm the project manager for the Veterans Creation Program. Um, and I'm joined by Kim Blanke, our assistant project manager. Um, we wanted to start off by really thanking um, you guys for giving us the opportunity to present today. Um, we present, we appreciate every opportunity we're given to share information about what we think is a pretty cool program. So next slide, please. So before I start, I want to note that while the VCP is funded by the Corps of Engineers, or USACE going forward in this talk, um, the program is managed by New South Associates, a CRM uh, firm headquartered in Stone Mountain, Georgia. So as such, all staff members, including Kim and myself, are New South employees. And I say this because uh, at the beginning here, I have a few slides um, that discuss USACE and how the VCP kind of fits into the overarching mission. Um, however, Amy McPherson, VCP Amy McPherson, VCP Program Manager, and Sharon Kenobi, the VCP Project Manager um, on the USA side, are in the audience today, and I'll be happily be corrected by them if I get any of this wrong. So, now that that's out of the way, um, I'll open things up by talking a little bit about USA's mandatory center of expertise for the curation and management of archaeological collection or, you know, that's a long name, so I'll just call it the MCX going forward. So the MCX delivers a wide variety of services um, that help the core maintain their compliance uh, with archeological collections management. Um, I won't read through, through that long list, but um, that's just a, you know, small list. It's by no means exhaustive. Um, as the MCX kind of expands and contracts its mission, uh, to serve the ever-changing collection and curation needs of USACE, as well as other DOD, federal, and state agencies. Next slide. So the ball started rolling in the 1990s with the enactment of 36 CFR Part 79, um, as well as the Native American Graves uh, Protection Repatriation Act, um, or NAGPRA. Federal agencies were now responsible for adhering to basic standards for the um, management long term uh, of collections, archaeological artifact and document collections. Additionally, their collections were subject to NAGPRA now and needed to be inventoried for that purpose as well. Um, so the MCX kind of came into existence as a technical center of expertise in 1992, I think. Amy can correct me on that, and became an MCX in 1994. Um, next slide. So um, due to the enactment of the previously mentioned 36 CFR uh, Part 79, as well as NAGPRA, uh, USA started the process of researching and locating and fully assessing the collections that fell within their stewardship responsibilities. Um, the MCX contacted over 800 facilities to determine um, who held USACE collections. And as I kind of, you see in that slide, it was called the 2000 Collection Condition Assessment Project. Um, well over 150 repositories, 166 to be exact, um, were identified. And through a combination of site visits um, and mail-in surveys, the MCX were able to kind of put all the pieces of the puzzle together and to see the big picture of their collections. And it was a very big picture. Um, as you can see, in terms of artifact volume, over 47,000 cubic feet 
as well as over 3,000 linear feet of records um, were identified. And so, as it says in that bottom bullet, uh, a lot of those collections were assessed and deemed at risk. So they weren't stored um, or curated in compliance with those uh, federal curation standards and were in danger of losing their context and research um, value. Next slide. So, um, how are how are all these this massive number of collections generated? Um, beyond the management and construct, you know, construction and design for DOD and other federal agencies here and abroad, um, a large part of USACE's mission relates to the management of waterways. So whether that's through construction and operation of locks and dams, um, the regulation of lakes and their public use areas, or flood protection systems. So starting in the late 1940s and continuing through to the late 80s, um, we, you know, here in the U.S., we saw a huge number of large-scale public works projects. And so, um, as you kind of see on that slide, I'm going to zero in on one of those projects to just provide an example. Um, so, the Tennessee Tom Bigby Waterway um, was an artificial waterway constructed between 1972 and 84 um, to provide an additional corridor for the shipment of goods. And during that, the cultural resource mitigation for that project, um, the 234 mile corridor was uh, surveyed um, by well over a dozen universities, cultural resource management firms, um, other private companies to assess uh, the cultural impact, you know, the cultural resources that would be impacted as a result of this public works project. And over 900 sites were identified and investigated. So the collections generated from these investigations were housed at the University of Alabama and Mississippi State University, and they sat largely undisturbed and um, until the collection condition assessment that I previously, previously mentioned had taken place. So if one public works project could generate so much material, we can kind of start to see how the picture got so big. Um, and this story has been repeated over and over again um, with every public works project. Collections from these projects um, were often were found to be at risk and largely inaccessible for research. Next slide. So here we're going to start to see kind of something happening at the same time um, as this collections condition assessment. And Kim is going to talk about this, this kind of side of the story. Kim, you're on mute if you. Someday in the age of these virtual meetings, we will all remember to not start talking while we were on mute. I sincerely apologize for that. Uh, thank you, Allison. So if you are not aware of who Dr. Sonny Trimble is, he is the former director of the MCX CMAC, and he is also the person who I mean, the VCP is his brainchild. So from August of 2004 until May of 2007, Sonny led a mass graves investigation team that was working on the systematic ex excavation, documentation, forensic analysis, and reporting of mass graves in Iraq. And he investigated numerous sites where nine graves were eventually excavated. Throughout that process, and Sonny being in Iraq, he was protected by active duty Army soldiers. And they really worked hand in hand to make sure that the work was done, but also the entire team was kept safe throughout that time. And as they were working on that project, over 400 individuals were recovered and repatriated through their work. So what does that really mean for the VCP? Like I mentioned, the VCP is Dr. Sonny Trimble's brainchild. After returning home, Sonny saw that several of the veterans that had protected him during his time in Iraq were experiencing widespread unemployment or even underemployment. And this was really happening in a large part to the entire veteran community. That was not just specifically the soldiers that protected him. And he saw an opportunity to educate and employ veterans while also rehabilitating those archeological
uplifting and innovation. The Veterans Curation Program was created and has been in operation since 2000. Alrighty, <clears throat> excuse me. So the Veterans Curation Program was created for two purposes. One, to provide veterans a bridging experience from military service into the public sector, and then also to process those at-risk collections that belong or are under the stewardship of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, like I had mentioned. We have four flagship locations and two satellite locations. Our first flagship location opened in Augusta, Georgia in 2009, and then later in 2009, our location in St. Louis was opened Alexandria in 2011 with San Mateo opening up in 2018. Excuse me. And then for our satellite labs, we did have University of Arkansas that opened in 2019 and Texas State University that opened up in 2018. And one of the biggest differences between our flagship locations and our satellite locations is that our flagships are self standing, where our flag, or sorry, our satellite locations are within a university and work with a partnership along those lines. And I'm going to hand it back over to Allison really quickly, who's going to tell us a little bit more about that collection rehabilitation. Allison? Yes, okay, just move to the next slide. Ready? It's not. I don't see it advancing. Um, let me see. Sorry, folks. Give me just a moment. These things are bound to happen. Indeed. All right. Can you see the collections rehabilitation slide now? I cannot. As long as everyone else can see it, we can move on though. No, it's not up. <clears throat> All right, fantastic. Give me just a moment. Um, Allison, would it be possible for you to take over presenting the PowerPoint by chance? Yes, one second. Allison, you're on mute. Mute myself. And can everybody see it now, or can you see the presenter view? We can see the presenter view. Okay. Can you see it now? Yes. Okay. So sorry about that again. As I previously mentioned, um, the MCX had determined that a large number of their collections uh, that were within their stewardship responsibilities were at risk of further deterioration or loss of that valuable scientific context. Um, so this is where the VCP comes into play. Uh, USACE districts and the MCX identify uh, these at risk collections and um, for and they make them candidates for rehabilitation at VCP labs. So um, these collections arrive at the VCP and managers conduct an intake assessment and determine a processing plan that meets the needs of the collection. So um, the VCP in terms of our artifact re rehabilitation, the VCP utilizes processing standards that have been developed by the NCX uh, to preserve all the original information from the original bag labeling and the original association between bags and artifacts. So VC, our VCP technicians process collections um, box by box and bag by bag, uh, and they sort artifacts according to a controlled vocabulary of uh, material classes and artifact descriptions. So each artifact description receives what we call an artifact ID, and it's just a tracking number that rather than replacing any previous analysis done, 
um, these descriptions and artifact IDs allow us to uh, kind of place a scaffold over what is already there. And in doing so, um, we have a means to create an electronic catalog. So all of that original information is retained, um, but we're able to create a searchable catalog. And in addition, um, during processing, we're rehousing all of these materials into archivally stable containers and reorganizing these collections if necessary, it's not always necessary, um, to increase their accessibility. So um, on the slide, you'll see uh, that box in the top um, right corner, I get my lefts and my rights mixed up. Those are actually collections from the Tennessee Tom Bigby Waterway Project. Um, so I was kind of using an example that would uh, relate very you know, closely to the images that you would see on the screen. So we have those collections currently housed um, at the Augusta VCP, and we've been slowly working our way through them and kind of following the process that you see in those photos. So um, taking them from a mass of paper bags in a box to um, a very well organized collection, you know, contained within arch archivally stable, stable and acid free Ziploc bags with um, tags that identify everything and enable us to track and organize the collection a lot better. On the document side of things for records rehabilitation, um, much like we do with the artifacts, um, the associated records um, with these archaeological investigations uh, come into our facilities as well. And so if necessary, um, these documents are resorted into record series um, that would commonly be associated with archaeological investigations. So um, most of these investigations involve an administrative kind of period, a background research period, a field period, an analysis period, and then a report writing period. And so we've created record series that coincide with those, um, those aspects of an archaeological investigation. Um, and I say if necessary, uh, because sometimes the collections arrive in already, you know, with a beautiful arrangement scheme in place. And if that's the case, we won't mess with that. Um, so beyond arrangement, uh, we conduct um, description as well and assign each document or group of documents um, with a within a folder with asset numbers. And again, this aids us in our efforts to create a digital catalog or database. Um, that is searchable for these document collections as well. Um, much like with the artifacts, again, we conduct rehousing and cleaning and mending as necessary to stabilize these collections for long-term storage uh, in accordance with those previously mentioned basic federal standards. So in terms of our digitization procedures, um, those searchable catalogs or data, it, or databases that I previously mentioned, um, we capture a representative photographic sample of all of the artifact collections, um, with the exception of those um, collections that, that may be associated with NAGPRA. Um, we've refined our photography processes over the years to capture real museum quality images, and we're really proud of the, the processes that we use because as you can see, um, we create really great photographs. Um, that representative sample could be anywhere from five to 10% of each box or each portion of the collection. Um, and then for our document collections, we digitize all documents and photos and connect them with the physical documents and the database via those previously mentioned asset numbers. So the final product of our VCP processes are collections that have been fully rehabilitated, digitized, and have accompanying searchable catalogs. So speaking of, we've kind of spoken about our technicians throughout this uh, presentation, but you may be wondering how we train our tech veteran technicians to accurately and efficiently process these artifact and document collections. So one factor are those processes that I mentioned where we use a controlled vocabulary. Um, we have a set kind of a set of record series for the document collections and um, but beyond that, we've developed a variety of training and teaching aids and activities. So um, we use hands-on training activities such as the prevenient mat, prevenience mat in the bottom left corner of the, of the page. Um, we designed a, uh, you know, a transportable kind of excavation unit square 
uh, where we can stick, um, you know, fake artifacts and help technicians gain an understanding of how we um, how we record provenience in an archaeological site, and that knowledge um, helps them understand the the descriptions that they're seeing on artifact bags and in the documents that they're handling day to day. Um, we also have processing guides and visual aids. Uh, at the top of the slide, uh, you can see our VCP um, wall art. And this is just two examples of multiple pieces of wall art that we have in every facility um, where we help technicians to remember the information that needs to go on the document folders that we create. Um, and the top right corner, you can see material classes that we use at the VCP and visual examples of what um, of the artifact descriptions that are contained within those material classes. Um, but beyond that, we've got you know, a lot of different um, activities that we use. Um, and we also bring in guest speakers from the archaeological community to help our technicians kind of gain a, a, an appreciation and an understanding um, for the things that they're processing. Uh, in the bottom right corner, um, that's the Augusta lab, and we brought in a flint knapper um, to help technicians understand kind of what all these, you know, this lithic material in the boxes was and how it was generated. Um, beyond uh, processing guides and visual aids and hands-on activities, we also really heavily rely on co-learning and peer review. So technicians are checking each other's work. Um, we're going, you know, the managers are going, you know, from table to table or technician to technician and answering questions and providing that constant feedback to help us kind of hone their processing ability. So uh, beyond providing the technicians with training, uh, we have a few other um, benefits to the participants and Kim will do this portion of the, the slide. Thank you, Allison. So yeah, we've talked a lot about the benefits to the collections, but as a former technician myself, I can really tell you how beneficial the things that I have learned at the VCP have been to my career, both at the VCP, but also the short time that I spent between being a technician and returning as a lab manager here in the St. Louis area. So prior to coming to the VCP, I had taken a little bit of time between service and employment to stay at home and kind of evaluate what I needed for moving forward, what did my family need, and all of those kinds of things. Um, and you know, the supportive environment within the VCP really provided me the stable ground to evaluate in a professional setting as well what I needed. And that was just really invaluable to me as I navigated my return to the civilian workforce. <clears throat> Excuse me. And part of that support included what we call PGD, which is professional growth and development. This is allotted paid time throughout the week to have hands on assistance with goals. And one of my favorite things about PGD is that the managers meet the technicians where they are and tailor the assistance to the individual. So we may have technicians that come to us that already have a bachelor's degree, but they're just not sure how to apply that to their professional life. They may have just recently got out of service and they have no idea what they want to do beyond the service. There's just so many various stages of life that our technicians are in when they come to us that meeting them where they are is absolutely crucial for their success. Additionally, you know, I gained a number of technical skills that ranged from learning the most up-to-date Microsoft Office software, because let's be honest, the Marine Corps didn't always provide me the most up-to-date software um, usability. And then also all the way over to photographic and digitization skills that I may not have otherwise gained. And you know, um, a fun added bonus for myself, and I think for really every other veteran that has gone through the program is one that Allison mentioned, which is gaining an understanding and appreciation for archeology span that we may not have had before. And in turn, we're also able to pass that along to our children. When I was growing up, my idea of archeology span was, you know, Indiana Jones. And <laughs> I had no idea that that was even an option for a career as I moved forward in life. And I didn't really understand the actual benefits to the world around me because I didn't understand archaeology as a whole. 
And so now that I know I get to pass that along to my children, as I mentioned, and I have heard that sentiment from several other technicians that I have interacted with. Next slide. So as far as successes and accomplishments go, you know, obviously it is a huge success to have those collections finalized, but also for us, it's a huge success to have our technicians rehabilitated however much they needed to be able to enter the civilian workforce or or go back and get some education so that they can achieve those civilian workforce goals. As you can see here, we have assisted over 750 veterans with 26 currently participating across the VCP as a whole. 91% of those veterans have obtained employment or gone on to continue their education and whatever that might look like for them. And, you know, collections are super important. So I would like to mention that we have rehabilitated 490 USACE collections up to federal standards. And that's just really fantastic to me personally that we have the opportunity to rehabilitate those collections and people's careers at the same time. <clears throat> Slide. So what does that mean for after the VCP? Well, one, once you're in the VCP, you never really leave us. So we're always here to help out in any way that they might need. And as I mentioned, we are striving to meet technicians wherever they are and accommodating their needs. And that may not include them going into CRM or any kind of related field. We have had technicians that have gone on to become chefs work in other federal agencies that they didn't even realize that they still qualified for and like just about everything possible in between. On the flip side of that, we also have technicians that realized that CRM work was their dream job and the arena that they really wanted to work in. So they have had the ability to interact with professionals that have already been working that in that field that can help guide them really hands on to make sure that they are going through the process to be as successful as they possibly can within that realm. <clears throat> Next slide. And so we're going to talk really quickly about what you guys can do to help support the veterans successes within the veterans curation program. And we realize that everybody is at a different level of ability or desire to help out, so it may look really different for everybody. For some of you, it may look like just following us on social media, liking our page and just keeping up to date with what's going on. It could be coming to attend any one of our meet and greet events, which I can drop some uh, invitations for you guys in the chat box here in just a couple of minutes because we are currently ramping up to host all of our meet and greets at our four flagship locations. It could also be that, you know, you just want to learn more about the VCP than what we've offered here today. And if you're nearby a flagship location, you come in for a tour. We are always happy to have people come through and meet with our technicians, look at the collections and just overall gain a better understanding of what the Veterans Curation Program is providing. Additionally, please let us know when you are hiring people. Uh, we may have the next asset to your team hiding inside of one of our labs that's just super ready to meet you and super excited to be a part of your facility, your company, whatever that may look like for you. And additionally, on the flip side of that, you might know a veteran or two that needs our help. So please don't keep us quiet. Let them know that we exist. Let them know that we're ready to help them and meet them where they are with their professional needs. And as always, if you are hosting an outreach event, we love coming to talk to people. So we would love to host a table at one of your outreaches, outreach events. So you just let us know what that looks like for you. <clears throat> Excuse me. And if you need any extra information, we do have all of our contact information here for you guys. Check out our website, go like and follow on that Instagram and Facebook. We really love our, our social medias. Each lab has a um, specific social media person that helps really create that content uh, in hand in hand with the technicians. So that's super exciting. And then also contact information for Allison, myself, and then Julie Dana, who is our outreach coordinator. If you have anything you would like to need or anything you'd like to do with us, we would love to hear from you. And thank you. Thank you, Allison and Kimberly. Um, I'll let everybody, um, if you are on mute, you can take yourselves off of mute now. And uh, if you want to ask Allison and Kimberly any questions, you're more than welcome to. Um, one quick question I had as everybody else is trying to formulate their own questions is, 
is the VCP um, trying to work with you say on getting more satellite uh, locations opened up to expand this program in the future? That is a great question, and I would love to kick it over to either Amy McPherson or Sharon Kenobi um, on the core side of things to answer that question, if possible. Hi, it's Sharon. Can you guys hear me? Yes. OK, wonderful. Uh, to answer your question, yes, I think we're really excited about the prospect of using the VCP model to work with other agencies within the DOD or even beyond. You know, I think we have over the past 12 years developed some really great standard operating procedures. Um, as you saw when Allison was talking about the rehabilitation of the uh, archaeological collections as well as the associated associated documentation, uh, we really have everything uh, standardized so that the product, if you go to, you know, repository A versus repository B, it's it's very similar and very easily accessible. So, you know, I think it would be our desire to really um, put our name out there and work with individuals who want to make uh, a model BCP in their location. Uh, next question, it, does the VCP participate in repatriation for artifacts of patrimony or human remains? If so, do you have any VCP success stories? So I can kind of answer the, the first part of that question um, and then again kick it over to Sharon Kenobi to, to answer the core side of things. Um, uh, we do often, um, not often, but relatively frequently uh, get collections that have NAGPRA, um, that have collections with components that are subject to NAGPRA. And I think that the VCP um, has played a big role in helping the, you know, um, the core to um, identify that and get, get the process started. And I will kick the rest of the question over to Sharon. Yeah, so, uh Kind of building on top of what Allison's saying, uh, here at the MCX, um, we work with our NACPRA team uh, in tandem with the VCP to ensure that we have procedures in place and that are implemented so that we can track um, potential NACPRA items uh, throughout the processing um, kind of as it unfolds. So before a collection comes in, we'll identify any known NAGPRA sites, alert the lab to uh, any materials within a collection from those known NAGPRA sites uh, to ensure that we're tracking and being as mindful and as respectful as possible. Um, and then we'll track it through the processing and sorting stage. If anything is identified, it's placed into a separate storage uh, location within the lab. Um, and we make sure that only managers are working with these potential um, ancestral remains. We want to make sure, you know, we're respectful again and mindful of those. So uh, kind of a long story short, the VCP doesn't specifically work on uh, compliance of NAGPRA, but because these collections are being actively worked on, you know, us as a agency, we do track and make sure that we're working on any remains uh, that could be in the collection and, and ensuring that they follow the compliance procedures. And then hopefully then that can end in re repatriation of those ancestral remains or items. Thank you, Sharon. Uh... Let's see here, hold on. Uh, thanks for the presentation. You mentioned uh, meeting veterans where they are at professionally. Does the curation program work with veterans to provide archaeological fieldwork experience or have, or do they have any partnerships for fieldwork for any interested veterans? Yes, so um, as part of the professional growth and development um, aspect of the portion you know, portion of the program that we do uh, over the course of the, the session. Um, we try to offer the technicians um, opportunities to um, within their local communities to uh, get out of the lab and experience archaeology um, and historic preservation firsthand. And so 
We partner with museums, um, uh, universities who are conducting field schools, um, historic sites to host field trips um, to those locations. Um, there have been situations where technicians have, you know, done a full day field trip to an archaeological site where they got to participate in screening or um, excavation and learn about, um, you know, excavation procedures. Um, we've been kind of behind the scenes at uh, museums such as the Smithsonian or, you know, a local um, city museum like the Augusta Museum of History um, that's right down the street from the Augusta Lab. Um, and they get behind the scenes and learn how, um, you know, curation methods and kind of museum um, procedures. And in terms of partnership for field work, uh, we've gotten, we've developed various partnerships over the course of our, the program that um, we kind of point technicians to if they're interested in getting more field experience. So um, we've had technicians who have um, gone on to do AVAR um, field trips or field work in the past. And I cannot remember what AVAR stands for right this second. I'm sure Kim will step in or, or share it at some point. Um, but beyond that, um, there's college, colleges or universities um, that have hosted veteran uh, field experiences, and we've had uh, our technicians participate in those as well. Yeah, I'll just uh, chime in really quick. I know that uh, this past spring we had some technicians from the St. Louis lab and I believe Augusta worked with Juniata College out of the Northeast area. And, and I know that was a specific uh, veteran field school. So I think that was a, a really great partnership that we hope to continue um, the next time there's a field school. Yes, it was fantastic. Actually, uh, two of the technicians that were able to join that from the St. Louis area uh, went on to be historians for USACE. So it's super exciting. OK, thank you. Um, what kind of impact did the pandemic have on the VCP? In what ways did you have to change the program to make it work for everything that happened? <laughs> Uh, so, you know, obviously the pandemic impacted literally everybody, every organization, every company, every individual human, it definitely impacted. Uh, one of the ways that we were able to still assist veterans and these and processing these collections was we created a term that was just slightly longer than our average five months to make sure that we were compensating for the drawback in employment and still offering those technicians the opportunity to be gainfully employed while seeking those positions in that weird time frame. Um, additionally, we did have to reduce our class sizes just to make sure that we were really being able to, you know, support that social distancing, keeping transmission rates low and things like that. And we are still keeping an eye every single day on CDC guidelines, CDC data regarding transmission rates, and we are adapting accordingly within each individual lab. And this is Amy McPherson. I'll also say that during the period of time that we did not have veterans in the lab because um, a lot of the uh, areas, the communities were uh, were observing isolation, we worked on a lot of the lab infrastructure. There was redesign of the wall art that you saw in the presentation. Um, the lab managers also uh, retooled and revamped the manuals that are used extensively in the daily, you know, the day to day operation of the lab. Um, while, you know, overall the the pandemic was hard on on all of us, I think that the the New South and USA's team was able to use the time where we didn't have veterans in the lab with us to produce uh, better tools when we were able to get them back in the lab. We've also learned, I think, just to put in that these virtual type of events are incredibly valuable. We didn't do too many of them before the pandemic, which I think probably a lot of people didn't. Um, but we've done some virtual meet and greets and we've been able to, you know, uh, fold other groups of people who wouldn't otherwise have been able to attend the in-person meeting. So I think that that's something we're thinking about doing um, maybe once a year. Um, going forward because that really has turned out to be something that was very uh, popular. 
Yeah, and I'll, I'll add to that as well. I think uh, Allison and Kim would agree with me, but I think we really learned the importance of in-person outreach, really getting out in the community and maintaining those relationships with our community stakeholders. So I think, you know, it's, it's two, three years into this pandemic, um, but I think we're finally getting out there and, and remembering kind of what those motions are and, and getting back and, and making sure we can meet those people and then ensure that we can get some good candidates that would benefit from the program. Absolutely. We've been, um, you know, as Sharon was kind of mentioning, uh, there were a lot of positives and negatives in the, in the, that came out of the pandemic. One of them being that we weren't able to get out in the community or have the community come to us as frequently. And we, um, I think that not being present in the community on a consistent basis as we were before, um, in some areas, we kind of, some people forgot about us and that has been um, on our minds lately and we've been making an active, um, very, you know, strong effort going forward to uh, really amp up our outreach again, our community outreach and getting out of the lab, um, whether that's dropping flyers at a veterans um, student veteran office at a university or um, dropping flyers at the vet center or um, you know, pre presenting at the library to, you know, to kids about archaeology. Um, we're doing all of those things now. And so that's kind of what we're trying to do to get back out there. Thank you. Um, I'll wait another few minutes for some people. I have kind of a twofold question to ask you. Um, what percentage, um, because you, Army Corps, and this might be a better question to be answered by Sharon or Amy, um, Army Corps has done a lot of archaeology projects over the years. Um, what do you think is the percentage of collections you have left to complete? I'll take that one. So, so we're we're aware of uh, over fifty one thousand cubic feet of archaeological collections and archives that are in need of rehabilitation. Uh, and so far, the VCP has um, been able to process and finalize a little over 2,000 uh, cubic feet of that. So I think we, we still have a long way to go, but we're making progress while we have veterans you know, benefiting from this work. Um, I think it's a really exciting program and we're, we're happy to continue it and work on those USACE collections or others in DOD and beyond. Yeah, OK, so to pick you off, the reason why I'm asking is because anyone who works in archaeology or museum collections knows that right now the biggest debate in collections management are is how do we manage the collections, especially when with the metal artifacts that we are finding. Um, we all love those nails on all those rusty little bits. And what have you guys determined? what you're going to do with all that or have you just decided just to stick with the standard for now and if there comes a time to revisit those collections that have the majority of those larger metal objects and see what you could do about them either photograph them x-ray them um uh, and then discard them you know document them and then discard them or just keep them as it is because space is always limited in collection rooms so that's one of the reasons why i ask so i'll answer at least part of that question um our office uh, we're the mandatory center of expertise for curation um for the the corps of engineers and once the um deaccessioning guidelines came out, we started working immediately with our headquarters on what uh, implementing those guidelines would look like. Um, so we are working on that, although we don't have anything um, set yet. I know that there's going to be, uh, I think there's like a panel or a committee that's going to determine some of these things. But um, the things that you mentioned are definitely things that we've been considering to um, whether they would be x-rayed and then um, discarded, x-rayed, photographed, uh, conserved, depending on what they are. That really hasn't been determined yet either, but we are looking at not just metal, but firecrack rock and um, just any sorts of collections that would meet um, sort of what are still theoretical um, guidelines or thresholds for uh, 
for curation, but that's something that's very much on our minds as well. Okay, does anybody else out there in the audience have any other questions? No, going once, going twice. Oh, we kind of got one in. Uh, Daniel asks, uh, thank you for sharing all this information. When you, when you rehabilitate archives or collections, what steps do you take to make sure the collection doesn't require future reorganization? So I think that when it comes to document collections, um, it's a little bit more loosey goosey than with artifact collections because uh, depending on which archivist looks at it, <laughs> they may have a different organizational scheme. Um, and I think that the, the goal uh, at the, each BCP when it comes to document collections is to um, meet the collection where it is and organize collections according to a scheme that makes the most sense to future research. So uh, for an artifact collection that came into our facility that was organized strictly by material class, uh, that may mean um, reorganizing it um, by provenience or um, uh, by site and then with pr by provenience or if we can't if we've got a document collection um, that uh, has you know components or aspects that don't fit within those previously mentioned kind of vcp record series that we have utilized um, we we can change the script and come up with something that kind of meets the needs of that collection and um, Amy McPherson said something in the past that I always try to remember um, when it comes to an organizational scheme. If you can't explain it in a few sentences or less, then it's probably not the best scheme. Um, so I don't think there's really any way to ensure that a collection won't be reorganized in a different way in the future um, because that, you know, that kind of falls to the whims of, of opinion. Um, but I can say that we are maintaining that original association and that original order for both artifacts and documents. Um, you know, if someone came in, in the, you know, and didn't like the way the VCP did it, they could uh, theoretically reconstruct the entire um, organization scheme that existed, you know, previously. And so we try to take those steps, you know, and be responsible. And to build off of what Allison is saying, one of the things that we did for VCP that is really extremely different than traditional archives is those five um, set series. In traditional archives, you would never have that kind of um, rigid structure that you just kind of organically go with what the records tell you. Um, when we started developing the system internally for our own use for the office and then for to expand it to VCP. We didn't just do it because it makes teaching archives easier, all, although it does. Um, we also did it because we looked at the collections, uh, particularly um, from my from my side from archives, the way that we felt like archaeologists and other archaeological, anthropological researchers would look at the collection, which we felt was in those sort of almost chronological steps of, a, of an investigation. I think that putting the uh, collection, the archival collection together that way um, is most natural to most archaeologists and archaeological researchers. And so I think that because we're thinking like the researcher, we're sort of preemptively organizing it the way we think they would want to see it, which I think does help prevent reorganization in the future. Um, I've, I, early on in my career, I processed an archaeological collection the way I would do it as an archivist, and it really did end up getting reorganized um, it, the way a user would want it. So I think that, um, and, and I think that that probably happens with the, the objects as well, that we try to um, look at them like a researcher. Um, sometimes, though, we do get uh, requests from repositories to organize them in ways that um, we feel are not conducive to uh, researchers. However, um, we do try to comply with um, the requirements of the repository they will be housed at. But that's a really good question. Thank you. 
Um, if anybody else doesn't have any questions, we can end the presentation. Does anybody else have anything else they would like to ask? No, OK, um, well, I think we'll end the um, presentation here. Uh, thank you so much to the VCP and to uh, the uh, US Army Corps of Engineers representatives for coming on and discussing the VCP. It's a great program and um, anybody else who's on here, please tell your friends, tell your family, shout it from the rooftops. It's a great program and thank you so much for joining us on today's uh, DOD webinar series presentation. Everyone have a good day. Goodbye. Thank you everybody. Thank you so much.